Donald Trump seems to be the first Republican to realize Americans really don't want to ban abortion. Will his state's rights triangulation work? In related news, Arizona Republicans are literally taking the state back in time. Seems like that might be a big deal in a battleground state in an election year. Uh, let's see. The New York Times did an expose on Kushner cash, and we'll talk about whether or not you should bring this up when people bring up Biden or just pivot to the issues. A real Trump trial, the criminal sorts, is happening. A president of the United States on trial for crimes. We take it for granted as if it's happened before, but it seems worth discussing. In the second half of today's show, we'll be joined by Sarah McCammon of the NPR Politics Podcast. We'll ask Sarah about Trump's most recent abortion position and how it's likely to play with evangelicals. Welcome back to the podcast for the 54% of Americans who vote for progress in every election and want to convince their conservative friends and family members to join our majority. This is Majority 54. Well, Jason, you and I have long said that Trump is going to triangulate or attempt to on abortion. And, uh, well, he really signaled his intent this week. Let's go to this clip. My view is now that we have abortion where everybody wanted it from a legal standpoint, the states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both. And whatever they decide must be the law of the land. In this case, the law of the state. Many states will be different. Many will have a different number of weeks or some will have more conservative than others and that's what they will be. At the end of the day, this is all about the will of the people. You must follow your heart or in many cases, your religion or your faith. Do what's right for your family and do what's right for yourself. Do what's right for your children. Do what's right for our country and vote. So important to vote. I want to thank the six justices, Chief Justice John Roberts, Clarence Thomas, Samuel Alito, Brett Kavanaugh, Amy Coney Barrett, and Neil Gorsuch, incredible people, for having the courage to allow this long-term, hard-fought battle to finally end. Many people have asked me what my position is on abortion and abortion rights especially since I was proudly the person responsible for the ending of something that all legal scholars, both sides, wanted and, in fact, demanded be ended. Roe v. Wade. They wanted it ended. I mean, like, apparently we all wanted this, Ravi. <laughs> I mean, I think, like, the, the tempting thing to do is to point out the contradictions. Like right. The guy was pro-choice in the 90s and then he took credit you know obviously when he ran for president he he you know basically did a full 180 and then he took credit for the dobbs decision as he seems to be doing in this video all while saying that he um would not support a uh, federal ban he just said earlier today he clarified that he would not sign a federal ban now I think it's tempting to make fun of this position and to point out the contradictions. But I think as a starting point, I think this is given the cards he has is the smartest political move to make. I think like this is I'm not sure he's ever going to be in a strong position on abortion, given where the electorate is. But this is probably the best way to try to trick everybody into thinking that he's a moderate on this issue. And I've already seen language to that effect in quite a few places that he's moderating, that he's triangulating, yada, 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 where th th this is how the Overton window shifts. This is somehow triangulating now. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, this is, um, this is the luxury of not having a real primary anymore. If he, if he had an opponent in the primary, he wouldn't be able to do this, but he's right. in the general election. He's in the general election much earlier than a, a challenger would usually be, because even though he was president, he is the challenger. Uh, and so he's able to do this. Um, I agree with you, uh, but I'm going to make fun of it for a second, um, <laughs> which is which is that like basically Trump's position is uh, do whatever you want, uh, because we all know I don't really care. <laughs> Right. I mean, his so that's the interesting thing is he's moderating his position to a place that is kind of actually his real position, right? Like he's responsible for and takes credit for ending Roe v. Wade, which he completely dishonestly says everyone wanted to have happen. Um, I mean, just made that up out of whole cloth. But the but this position of like, Eh, every state can do what they want. I don't really care is probably how Donald Trump actually feels about it. 
which For is sure. crazy. I mean, yeah, I, I think he 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 definitely doesn't care. I think it's very possible he has pressured multiple women to have abortions in his life. I think that's I, I would if I were a betting man, I would bet on that fact. Yeah. He's never answered that question, which yeah. is like he's been asked it and he's never given an answer, which is kind of how you know what the answer is. Yeah. Uh for instance, I'm able to say no. Yeah, it's a pretty simple it's, question. It's, I mean, and, yeah. and like, you know, if if I'm not saying that like if a couple made that decision, I judge it. I'm just saying yeah. I, yeah. I I've been I've been around for 42, almost 43 years, and I remember most of them pretty clearly. And that was yeah. that was not part of the journey. I think this is smart politics. Uh I again I don't think his hand is good. I just think this is the best way to play the hand he has, which is mm -hmm. he's banking on the fact that his base is going to be with him no matter what. And that is a safe assumption. Uh he can't completely backtrack on his positions on abortion because that may be too much to ask of his base. Um and in many ways they view his language is subtle. Like he's saying, we want that's what he's saying. He's saying we already won this battle. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so he's saying, look, we won. That's it. We're not going to go any further. And he's, and he's, he's I, saying, I, don't, be, don't be mad at me because it's over. Yeah. We won. I can yeah, now and, I can say what I want. And then when Lindsey Graham and then Marjorie Dannensfelser, who is the head of Susan B. Anthony Pro Life America, when these people came after uh, Trump on this, Trump said something really interesting back to them. Uh, he said, Lindsay, Marjorie, and others fought for years unsuccessfully until I came along and got the job done. Mm -hmm. And if I'm an evangelical sitting around the table, this is how we'll talk more about this later. Uh, they are willing to put aside. I had a good conversation with Tim Alberta from New York Magazine about this. He wrote a whole book about evangelicalism. We're about to have a whole another conversation about this, where they sit around and they're like, personal conduct aside, yada yada yada. The Bible is filled with imperfect vessels for the gospel, right? So they're saying like, this guy has come from wherever uh, and is is an imperfect vessel to get the job done. And, and you know, he may be somebody who's, you know, a like a walking uh, violation of the Ten Commandments, but he's somebody who's, he's a warrior for us. And I think Trump recognizes that this is the framework and plays right into it. And he's got a bunch of gullible people who are willing to go along with it. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, his, his what he's basically saying here is, uh, look, we're on the same side. You let me do the politics. Yeah. You do the anti-abortion stuff. Yeah. I handled your politics for you. Yeah. You know, I did what you couldn't do. I handled your politics. Now you just go keep doing that stuff that you do and I'll do the politics because clearly I'm better at that. And as he's reprehensible right. of a human being right. as he is, he yeah. is right. Like, yeah. And was, and. Yeah. But, but this is why I think it's important. If you've got, you know, like a Bob Dole like figure lecturing you on abortion rights or whatever, um, or even a Mike Pence, that's just not sellable. Like it, it's just so obvious. Uh, like it, it's like people are playing to type in a certain way that reminds people of like the 1990s era politics mm -hmm. and it turns people off. If you're like Trump and people are like, yeah, like this guy, I don't even know. Like part of part of it is I don't know what he's going to do next. Like, yeah, he appointed a bunch of pro-life justices. But if it's his second term and he doesn't need anything from anybody, is he really going to appoint pro-life justices? He's he, he flipped once. Maybe he'll flip again back to us. You know, this is what I think like Trump is banking on is people mm -hmm. saying like, you know what? Uh, actually saying he's flipped his position may actually make me more likely to like this guy because maybe he'll flip back to us. Well, I, 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 I don't think what he's trying to do is get like pro-choice women in the suburbs to vote for him and say like, you know, if abortion is a major issue for them, that I don't think he's doing that. I think what he's doing is he's trying to get women who are pro-choice, but for whatever reason, it's not one of the top issues uh, for them or something like that. Um, you know, they have, they're worried about immigration They're worried whatever else. Uh, some, any of the other stuff that he highlights, he's just trying to give them an excuse. It, this is what this is. It's give 
uh, particularly women, conservative women who have been have had uh, second thoughts about being conservative women because of this issue, give them license to go ahead and vote for you because a lot of them probably want to. Their husbands are voting for you. You know, their neighbors are voting for you. Uh, it's about giving them license. So I, I think that's a lot of what this is. And to some extent that will be successful. Now, what's interesting is historically, this is extremely similar to the popular sovereignty position that was taken pre-Civil War about slavery, right? Like, I know how we'll handle this. We'll just let every state make their own decision, which take the Civil War context out of it for a moment. That brings us into the political problem that it, it confronts now is it, it especially means if there's not going to be a ban of any kind, the, the votes in places like Florida, the votes in places like Arizona, when it's on the ballot and in Missouri, are going to be enormously important. I mentioned places like Florida and Arizona because those are presidential battlegrounds. Uh, and so I, what he wants to do ideally is just not have to talk about this. And in, because it is a, a, a state referendum issue in some battlegrounds, they're not going to have that luxury. Yeah, it's interesting. Like he wants to say, we've gone as far as we're going to go. We're going to go no further. Uh, and and I think that gets him what he thinks he thinks he needs. Like the Civil War example is interesting because I think the sort of revisionism around the Civil War has done some work on the narrative. Like the idea, like there still is a debate till this day about whether it was about states' rights or not, mm -hmm. and totally lost in some parts of this discussion is state rights to do what <laughs> right you know like it wasn't an abstract conversation uh, <laughs> right so, uh Arizona, states rights to own humans it's which would mean it was about owning humans right and in this case it's about you know women's bodies and women's I take this seriously, freedoms right i would say it's like the chiefs versus the bills you take the opponent seriously you should still win but you take them seriously and you put in the work. I think on this one, well, they need I mean, to, I'm, I'm <laughs> impressed. Keep going. They need to put in the work. Like, like I do think the the only chance Biden has to win this election is to win this argument and others. Like he must win this argument and he must win others. And by win the argument, I mean he has to convince people that Trump returning to the presidency is going to make permanent. Dobbs and extend Dobbs. Like mm -hmm. we have got to convince people of that. And Trump, I think, has brought out his queen now and we've got to now it's time to play. Uh Arizona, you mentioned the states. So we're gonna talk about Arizona and Florida. Um, Arizona Supreme Court Tuesday ruled that 160 year old <laughs> near total like before ban they were a state, <laughs> man, when they were like a flipping territory. <laughs> uh, near 160 year old ban. It was on the books. I don't know how it's in the books, by the way. Uh, well, I, it, I'm looking at your notes. It says it was then codified in 01 and 13, but still they weren't a state yet. So I don't, right. I right. don't know. Uh, Civil War era, talking about speaking of the Civil War. Uh, like, could you imagine what Arizona was like in the 1800s? Like, it's like one of these Westerns, you know? It's tombstone. Which is weird that they, you know, I, I'm really interested. Somebody's going to write this history. Like, what the what the was going on over there? You know what else they had in Arizona, by the way? I mean, it's a total sidebar, but they had in Arizona in, in that period is gun control. I mean, just oh, really? if we're, we're going to go backwards. I mean, it was like marshals could have guns. And anyway, so yeah, go ahead. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, it was a, side, a useless uh, sidebar. Continue, please. So, you know, the Supreme Court ruled that this is an enforceable law. Uh, essentially that basically abortions could be banned. They have a seven day uh, stay on their own decision. I think it's either seven or 14 days. Oh, 14 days. Uh, they're kicking it back to the lower courts to make sure there's no other challenges to this. Um, the democratic attorney general said, uh, quote, let me be completely clear. As long as I'm attorney general, no woman or doctor will be prosecuted under this draconian law in the state. Uh, the AG said it was unconscionable and an affront to freedom. To be clear, because what the law says is like women will go to prison. It's this. really crazy. Uh, it, All right, so that's Arizona. That's Arizona. Now, okay, I think it's worth stopping to talk about the politics of this. Now, Carrie Lake came out against this decision because, you know, these people realize – they can't really defend a lot of this stuff. Even though she is on video in the past saying, 
uh, we have a perfectly good law in the books we could go back to. <laughs> so it's on us to pin these people with their prior positions. Now, this is important because Arizona is a swing state. Now, is this going to remind people that when Trump says it's left to the states, that this is what it means? Like, we have to win that argument. So that we also have Florida, where there's a ballot initiative that would enshrine abortion rights, but we would need 60% of the vote there. Um, and there's all sorts of speculation about what Trump is going to say about that debate. Biden's team is indicating that this is going to put Florida in play, which I think nobody takes seriously, uh, including the Biden people. Um, but this is at least another place where people are being reminded of what it means uh, to give it back to the states. And, and as, as a lot of these, these referendums that have passed, I think Ohio is 59%. So it's like, it's, it's getting 60 is not easy. I think, uh, it could put it in the put in play to the extent that it could really force, um, the Trump campaign to spend actual money there to make sure yeah. that it doesn't come really into play, which is, which is notable. Um, and who knows, like maybe it could, like we underestimate this issue, we being everybody in the party consistently yeah. at the polls. And so I think it is possible. Here's for the people listening. This is how I think this plays out in your conversations. You are going to talk to people who are going to like, if you bring up the issue of abortion, who are going to say, you know what? They're leaving it up to the states. I'm fine with that. And particularly if you're in a state where uh, it is currently legal, that's an issue. Uh, but then the other thing is, I think there could be people who are like, look, I'm going to vote on the initiative. I'm going to vote to make abortion legal. Like if you're in a state where it's going to be on the ballot, I'm going to vote to make abortion legal in the state. And I'm going to vote for Trump because once once it's become legal in our state, they're not going to change it because that's what he said. And so I and I'm a Republican. I don't like the draconian abortion stuff, but this is how I'm going to vote. Like that's what they're going for. And so people listening to this need to be on alert for that because you have to counter that. You have to, and it's not enough just to counter it with, well, you can't trust them. You have to bring in the fact that, look, he's not going to change who's appointed to the court. This court wants to go after IVF, uh, uh, potentially they want to go after the abortion pill. Like the, so this is a charade, like, Mm -hmm. One way or another, it will end up with if you have Republican majorities and Republicans appointing the court, you won't have access to uh, to abortion. Yeah. And it's worth mentioning in the same clip, Trump, it, it, you know, made clear he supports IVF. Obviously, he's trying to shore up a certain sort of vulnerability that he has. He's trying to paint the Democrats as extremists on this issue. In the same clip we talked about, they basically want to, you know, murder newborns and He's saying, I'm the moderate. And our media is dumb enough to take this frame. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we need to push them on this. I, I by the way, to... oh, sorry, Robert. No, I, no, it... I, by the way, do not believe him when he says that he wouldn't sign a ban. Like if a ban got to his desk and he's in his second term and he doesn't care and his, and his party wants him to sign it and he wants to be a hero to his party and be able to show up at the rallies afterwards and everything, he's going to sign it. He yeah. will sign it. No question about it. And I think, it, well, speaking of the Trumps, the New York Times had this incredible article about the Kushner fund. So Jared Kushner has a $3 billion fund that, according to the New York Times, is financed almost entirely from overseas investors, surprise, uh, with whom he worked when he was senior advisor in the White House. He's taken money from the government wealth funds of Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the UAE, as well as Terry Gao the founder of Foxconn, the Taiwan-based electronics manufacturer, whose role in Mr. Kushner's firm has not been disclosed before this article. In total, 99% of the money placed with Kushner by investors comes from foreign sources. This is according to uh, SEC filings. Uh, this article is filled with lots of interesting details, including the fact that the Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund sort of board rejected Jared Kushner because they're like, why would we invest with this guy? He has no track record. There are plenty of other great um, funds. And then uh, Bin Salman, uh, the sort of, you know, basic de facto leader at this point of Saudi Arabia, who's close with Kushner, overruled his own board and went with Kushner. Nothing shady going on here, James. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know what to say other than 
people listening to this are gonna are thinking, well, how can they be talking about Hunter Biden when Kushner is doing this? And I just want to forewarn everybody that if somebody brings up Hunter Biden to you and you bring up Jared Kushner, you're just doing what they want. You're just making the two the two families the same, which is what the Republicans are after in attacking Hunter Biden. They want to mitigate uh, the clear, uh, you know, stain of corruption that is on the Trumps and by having you feel like it's not. So I just think if that happens, you can mention. Um, you bring up Kushner first. <laughs> That's the yeah, answer. Or, or bring up yeah. Kushner first. That's fine. Yeah. Like if you want to talk about that. But but I'd say keep in mind, and I've said it before, but I'll say it again. Keep in mind, this election is not going to be determined based on what people think about these two candidates. It's just not. And, and because Biden has been around forever. And at this point, people... They may think a lot of wrong things about Biden, but if they do, that's what they think. And people know what they're getting with Trump, man. I mean, like we've been through it with Trump, everything from COVID to corruption to everything else. And if people are still interested in potentially voting for Trump, then they're OK with all that stuff. This is, as I've mentioned, this is the closest you will get to a parliamentary style generic ballot R versus D election. It is two known quantities, so known and even even as deeply flawed as Trump is and, you know, Biden, even though they're about the same age, appears older. And that seems to be his greatest electoral flaw. Um, it, even with those things baked in, people are like, yeah, this is generic R versus generic D. And then it comes down to which party do you agree with? And in a way, that's kind of motivating. That's like we get to go out and make our argument about abortion and about jobs and about student debt and about guns, you know, and the list goes on. And if we commit to those things and make those arguments, well, we should win the election. Yeah. And all, I agree with all of that. And I think it's worth mentioning just because I, like, I feel obligated that this is different than Hunter Biden, right? Oh, and yeah, I know this is not the debate that we're having and all that. It's way more money. Um, and Kushner worked in government. Yeah, it's where he made all these relationships. Yeah, yeah. so I, I know, we that know that this, this stuff pre-exists him leaving government. Like, there's plenty of evidence of that. And so, yes, that's it. all true. I'm just, just sharing it because I, I can't help myself. Now, one more story before we get to our wonderful guest. Uh, New York. I'm really excited for spring and the summer, Jason. One of the things I'm most excited, the weather is so nice right now in New York. It's amazing. Now, one of the things I love to do is just walk down across the Manhattan Bridge. And as I walk across the Manhattan Bridge from where I live right now, there is the Justice Complex. Mm -hmm. And it's got the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District. It's got the federal courts where all the big trials happen, including SBF and all this kind of stuff. Um, it also has the Manhattan DA's office where my friend Alvin Bragg just got elected a few years ago and he's taken on Trump for this case that is set to have jury selection April 15th. And it is just a wonderful place to live where you're just in the middle of history and this jury selection is happening next week. So I know that we've, a lot of these cases haven't gone our way. This one is happening. And there was this uh, interesting little article in the New York Times about how jury selection is going to go down, and I'm super fascinated by this because Manhattan is a is is got a lot of different kinds of people in it. People, you know, it's admittedly very democratic. You know, like 70 percent of people are registered Democrats in Manhattan. Uh, but they talked about what is what are Trump's lawyers going to try to do? What's the process going to look like? And I'll just mention one little detail that stuck out to me, and I'm curious to see what stuck out to you. It said. Trump's lawyers want a jury that includes younger black men and white working class men, particularly public employees like po uh, police officers, firefighters, and sanitation workers. Those who have had bad experiences with the legal system will also be prized by the defense, which has cast the case as politically motivated. Yeah, this is sort of like at the beginning of the show when you were saying that Trump has been dealt a bad hand. I mean, he dealt it to himself, right? I mean, in both cases, he did the crimes and on abortion, he's the one who appointed the judges who, as he takes credit for it, brought down Roe. Um, but he's working from a bad hand. And so, yeah, this legal strategy makes sense. Like try and find the people in New York City who are more likely to lean toward Trump. And I would imagine that's probably cops and firefighters. I mean, 
what's embedded in that, I mean, they're saying white working class men, younger black men, and then cops and fire. All of those things sound to me like another way of saying men. Um, in most cases, I know not all cops and not all firefighters or sanitation workers are men, but I also know that the vast majority are. And so as a result, like that's what they're going for. Their best hope in a place that is 70 percent Democratic and probably like more than 70 percent didn't vote for him. Uh, you know, your best hope is to go with people who um, might might lean more conservative. And I uh, look, I'm going to go out on a limb. Think he's going to be convicted, and they, you know, you know, yeah. I mean, you never know. I mean, you just you need never one know. person. You just need one person. That's true. Uh, I and, don't think uh, he's going to be found not guilty. It's yeah. he he could get a hung jury, and and, the, and but that's all he needs, right? Because he's trying to run right. the clock. Which brings me to the point I was going to make, which is a minute ago I was saying none of this personal stuff matters because it's going to be about the issues. I do think. Look, the trials are going to be a major distraction and a major problem for Trump politically, whether you talk about them with your friends or not. But there is a way to talk about it that I think does have some salience, which is, look, I, what I would say to somebody is, look, I want a president who cares about people like me and cares about the kind of people I care about. Even if you think that Trump is that kind of person, probably not because he cares about people like you, but more because he seems to dislike the people you dislike. That's yeah. more often the way that people get there. But but either way, if that's if that's how you feel about Trump. The other thing is, I want a president who wants to be president for the country and not a president who wants to be president to avoid prison. And, and so to me, that would be the way to talk about these trials is like this dude is only running for president again to of to pardon himself and to avoid going to prison which means whatever it is you think he's going to do for you he ain't going to do he's going to get into office and he's going to do what he said he's going to give tax cuts to billionaires and you know gazillionaires and that kind of thing but he's not going to do things uh for you and the proof is he's only running to protect himself he's not running to help anybody else whereas Joe Biden yes he's 100,000 years old but is being president and running for president what you would want to do at 100,000 years old? It's probably also not what he wants to do at 100,000 years old, but he actually gives a damn, and that's why he's doing it. And that would be the way I would use these trials as an argument, and probably exclusively that way. Yeah, one one little interesting tidbit here is that uh, they're basically shielding the identity of these jurors, and they're limiting even what Trump can get access to because they're worried about the intimidation of the jurors. His lawyers, though, will know enough information to search their voter registration their social media histories, things like that. It's just, I thought that was interesting that they, um, former and possible next president of the United States is, uh, so irresponsible that he can't even know the, the identities yeah. of his own jurors. Well, not just irresponsible. So, uh, potentially threatening. I mean, it's, it's yeah. just, a, it's a mob case is what it is, right? It's, it's mafia stuff. It's well, true. Uh, yeah. yeah. Before we move on to Sarah on this, one thing I, I want to say is um, having participated in jury selection on the civil side before, um, it's even with all the information we have out there now, it's really hard to know. It's really hard to pick. We used to, because I don't know if there still are, but there used to be rules about, you know, not really asking what people, how people vote and stuff like that in jury selection. So we used to do things like, well, what channel do you watch and what magazines do you read and stuff like that? And there were plenty of times where I was like, oh, I know exactly where this person's coming from. And they turned out to be completely the opposite of what I thought. So, yep. Well, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we'll have a special guest to do a deep dive, not just in the question of Trump and abortion, but his entire relationship with the evangelicals and right wing uh, sort of Christian conservatives. So all that when we come back. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. If I had just one more hour of my day, I'd spend it with the ones I love most. A lot of us spend our lives wishing we had more time, and the question is time for what? If time was unlimited, how would you use it? The best way to squeeze that special thing into your schedule is to know what's important to you and make it a priority. Therapy can help you find what matters to you so you can do more of it. I've personally benefited from ther therapy myself. It's helped me learn positive coping skills and how to set boundaries. And therapy has powers. Th therapy has uh, can empower you to be the best version of yourself. And it isn't just those who've experienced major trauma. 
because of what you're going through, that truly matters. Uh, if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash m54 today and get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash m54. Sick of the one size fits all method, especially when it comes to your erectile dysfunctional treatment? Well, good news, now you've got options with Hims. Hims is changing men's healthcare, providing access to affordable sexual health treatments from the comfort of your couch. They provide access to doctor-trusted ED treatment options such as chewable hard mints, brand name treatments like Viagra, or generic alternatives for up to 95% cheaper. The process is simple and 100% online. No uncomfortable doctor's visits. So answer a series of questions from their site, and a medical provider will determine the right treatment option. If prescribed, your medication ships to you for free. No insurance needed. So if ED is getting you down, it's time to join hundreds of thousands of trusted HIMS subscribers and get treated. Start your free online visit today at hymns.com slash majority. That's HIMS, H-I-M-S dot com slash majority for your personalized ED treatment options. HIMS.com slash majority. Hard mints are chewable compounded products which are not approved or verified for safety or effectiveness by the FDA. Prescriptions require an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if appropriate. Restrictions apply. See website for details and important safety information. Subscription required. Prices vary based on product and subscription plan. All right, uh, we're, we're about to welcome uh, Sarah McCammon. Sarah is a national political correspondent for NPR and co-host of the NPR Politics Podcast. Her work focuses on political, social, and cultural divides in America, including abortion policy and the intersections of politics and religion. She is the author of the Evangelical, or the, sorry, the Exvangelicals: Loving, Living, and Leaving the White Evangelical Church, a 2024 book that is part memoir and part journalism about the movement of people who grew up inside the powerful evangelical subculture and ultimately left in response to its increasing politicization. She's also from Kansas City, Missouri, so you know that she is good people. Uh, how you doing? Hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm good. All right. Tell us about the book, because admittedly, uh, I don't think either of us have had a chance to read it, but we're excited. To hear, <laughs> I, you know, I appreciate your start honesty. selling. Um, yeah, <laughs> well, it's so it is part memoir, part reporting. You know, I grew up in uh, deep in evangelicalism in Kansas City uh, in the 80s and 90s. You know, I write about the fact that I was born about two weeks after Ronald Reagan was born in. And, you know, I, I watched as the evangelical movement I grew up in uh, responded to the, the Clinton Lewinsky crisis and scandal. And, um, you know, fast forward, I had my own kind of complicated uh, relationship with evangelicalism as I got older for a bunch of reasons. I felt like that label didn't work for me. And I carved out a career in journalism. Um, and then 2016, I'm assigned to cover the Republican primary and white evangelicals are kind of the center of that story, you know, about uh, there were so many questions about whether white evangelicals would embrace Trump, accept him, given his own sort of, you know, moral failings, for lack of a better word. Um, and I wound up talking to a lot of evangelicals about how they were thinking about this and sort of from that reporting and the intersection of my personal and professional life that I really never expected um, came this book, which is talking to a lot of people like me who um, have left evangelicalism, but have, I think, insight into the subculture, how people think, um, sort of what drives uh, both the religious and the political movement of white evangelicalism. Um, and so I think it kind of explains in a way, in a really granular way, kind of how we got where we are today. And what, just for people who are trying to make the distinction, what makes someone an evangelical versus some other denomination? Um, that is a great question. And it is something that, you know, journalists and pollsters and sociologists argue about. But I think generally when we're talking about evangelicals, often I try to make the distinction between white evangelicals and uh, otherwise, because the voting habits are so, so, so different. You know, if you look at, um, Black Christians and white Christians who hold similar theological beliefs, they tend to vote very, very differently. And so that's why we make that distinction in, in the subtitle. But um, when we're talking about white evangelicals, we're talking theologically about a group of people that really emphasize 
a relationship with Jesus. Uh, they emphasize the idea of sharing their faith with the world and um, typically take a pretty literalistic approach to the Bible. Many evangelicals, you know, for example, believe in creationism and some tend to have a skepticism of, of science, not all. Um, it's a really big movement. Um, you know, when I was a teenager and a young adult, so we're talking 20, 30 years ago, um, white evangelicals made up close to one in four Americans. And that number has been pretty steadily declining for about the past 20 years. So it's now about 14% of the population. And one of the things that um, some scholars have argued is that as white evangelicalism specifically and white Christianity more broadly have declined over the last several decades, that group has sort of felt its cultural power, cultural power declining, and that that can in part explain the deepening alignment with um, sort of right wing politics that we've seen. So, because that wasn't always about, the case. When I think about the term evangelical, it's like, I mean, the root is to evangelize, right? I mean, it's a it's it, it a central tenet of the faith is to, rec for lack of a better way of putting it, recruit others to the faith, and 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 to spread to spread the religion. So I guess, does that end up, I guess, manifesting itself politically through the idea of like, you know, the, the old thing people said, we're not trying to legislate morality. I mean, political evangelicals are trying to legislate morality. It's like the very definition of it, right? Well, if you, you know, or if you look at the rhetoric, yeah. The, I mean, historically from, and I'm not a historian, but <clears throat> I cite a few in the book. Um, from what I understand, you know, there was a time when evangelicals were much less engaged in politics. And some felt that they really should separate from, you know, sort of worldly politics. Um, but that kind of changed around, again, around the time that I was born or a little bit before uh, with the rise of the moral majority. And there's been a lot of really good work done by, by many historians and other journalists about how that happened. Um, you know, leaders like Paul Weirich and Jerry Falwell Sr., the late Jerry Falwell Sr. And um, of course, Pat Robertson, you know, worked together to build this coalition that uh, many historians have argued was, was driven in large part um, by a reaction to integration. Uh, schools like Bob Jones University did not want to have to integrate in order to keep their nonprofit tax status. Um, the IRS uh, changed its policies and, and required that as a condition of, of having a tax exempt status. And that helped to sort of um, launch this consolidation of the religious right not just around that issue, but around issues um, like abortion, of course, and later opposition to gay marriage and uh, and other issues that we see today. So um, I think over time, there's been a deepening alignment between e the evangelical Christian movement and the, the conservative right wing of the Republican Party. Uh, Pew just put out some, some data just, uh, I think, yesterday that shows that, you know, white evangelicals kind of steadily uh, more and more and more have been affiliating with with Republican politics for a long time, but that wasn't that it wasn't always the case, uh, the way that it is today. You know, obviously, the recent news on abortion and Trump's announcement, I think, remind us just how, uh, as a person, Trump is such an unlikely vessel for uh, you know a devout political base. Um, what have you, you know, both from your experience, but also from writing this book, like? What are the explanations people give for, uh, you know, giving their you know full throated support behind somebody who is such a flawed moral figure? Uh, and and I I seem to remember that early in 2016, Trump was way less solid with the evangelicals. It seems like something has changed over the years. Well, I think Trump pretty clearly has. If you look at his messaging, it seems very clearly targeted to uh, evangelical Christians, conservative Christians in general, who, again, see, you know, their numbers waning. The country's become more diverse. It's become more secular. And the proportion of the country that is a white Christian is, has been shrinking and shrinking, as I said. And so, you know, you see Trump speaking to a group of people whose influence is waning and saying things like, um, you know, when he a couple of weeks ago was selling that uh, God bless the USA Bible, <laughs> Truth Social, you know, he held it up and he said, Christianity is under siege. He used the word under siege. Um, and he talked about America kind of in decline. 
And the idea that we need to bring the Bible back, we need to bring Christianity back. There's this idea, you know, make America great again, right? That kind of has this idea of restoring something that once was, which has a lot of resonance, as I argue in the ex-evangelicals, you know, with people who've been hearing from their movement leaders for decades now, the idea that America's in decline, that it's moved away from God. Um, you know, this Christian nationalism uh, that we hear, you know, more, at least some politicians like Marjorie Taylor Greene openly affiliating with, some of those sentiments have been around for a really long time. They're not new ideas. They seem to have taken hold in a deeper way. Um, but I think that Trump has tapped into that and into, again, that, that longstanding messaging about decline of, of Christianity and, and the decline of influence of Christianity. And there's a really deep seated belief among many evangelicals that without Christianity, the country is going to fall apart and that Christianity is essential to um, not just essential to, to the functioning of this country, but that with it should be given sort of a privileged status above other above other faiths and it should be woven into the fabric of the government, that that was the idea that the founding fathers had. Of course, you know, if you study history, the founding fathers believed a lot of different things about religion, and they believed a lot of different things about what the relationship should be between religion and politics. But there's this kind of mythology around this um, in many ev evangelical circles that Trump taps into. And so I think what we've seen, you know, in terms of his appeal is his ability to speak into that and to make evangelicals feel like he will fight for them. Whether or not he is one of them is another question, but there's this sense that he will fight for them and for their goals. And we've seen that, right, with the overturning of Roe v. Wade. He has delivered on some of the evangelical movement's biggest goals that they had, you know, worked toward for decades. Um, he has made a point when he speaks to, to evangelical groups that he was able to get that done. Well, speaking of which, we before you came on, we spent the top half of the show talking about this political maneuver uh, that Trump has uh, pulled in the last few days, which is to say, you know what, this battle is complete. We have won. It is now in the states. So uh, please don't vote against me uh, if you're upset about abortion because there's really nothing left to be done. It's over, and this is how everybody wanted it, et cetera. It's a sort of a triangulation. Ravi and I were discussing it. And just to recap for you, we think it's kind of his only political choice uh, at this point. So it's what he's doing. But what I think we're curious to know from you with your expertise and having spent so much time thinking and writing about this, is this going to work? Is it going to do what he wants it to do? It's, it's so interesting to see the messaging around this unfold, right? Because I think Republicans and some have said so are, are well aware that the abortion issue has become, while it's like a, a victory, it's a huge victory for, for the conservatives, uh, right? It's also a, an area of political vulnerability. Um, we've seen, you know, from exit polls the last couple of years since the Dobbs decision uh, that overturned Roe v. Wade in 2022, um, we've seen uh, women, younger voters, than voters of color, which are three key Democratic constituencies, um, say that they're very motivated by this issue. Some of those groups listed as their top issue now. And we've seen, you know, in every case where abortion was put directly on a ballot, including in Kansas, uh, we've seen voters since the Dobbs decision uh, essentially support, you know, signal their support for abortion rights. And Republicans see that just like Democrats do. There are a lot of efforts to get more of those types of ballot initiatives on the ballot. Florida's going to have one. Looks like Arizona might have one. Uh, and, and about 10 other states or so are, are looking at them. And so I think Republicans have real concerns about that issue driving Democratic voters to the polls in big numbers in November, uh, as, as it has in the past. And so there seems to be um, internal debate among Republicans and among anti-abortion groups about exactly how far to push the envelope at this point and how to message around this issue. And I think that's what you see in Trump, really his mixed messaging on abortion. I mean, as you said, just the other day, he said that he would, you know, this has been left to the states. We're going to let the states figure it out. Uh, but then he was just quoted as saying he he wouldn't. I think he said he would sign a national ban. I need to double check what he said. He said he, no. He I think he said no. Every couple of, yeah, I think he, he would not no sign a national it. ban. Yeah. yeah. But, and then I know what he's about Arizona. Uh, you know, he was asked about the the Arizona law that just uh, that is about to take effect from from the 1860s, um, and he said that 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 went too far and that it would be figured out by the states. Which it, it's hard to even interpret what that what that really means. <laughs> And, and it makes me think that he he is he and his allies are still sorting out 
the messaging, which is which is really a challenge because you have, you know, you have the base of the Republican Party that's very opposed to abortion rights. You have the white evangelical base in particular. But then, you know, most Americans and the kind of swing voters that, that um, both Trump and Biden will be trying to win over, uh, those voters generally support abortion rights in at least some situations. And so um, it becomes a problem for Republicans potentially. So, I, you know, this show is, you know, aimed at uh, helping folks have conversations with uh, folks who disagree with this for progressives who want to have conversations with conservatives that are close to them, you know, in their family, their friend group, whatever. You've literally written a book about uh, growing up and, and leaving uh, the white evangelical uh, world. And I'm kind of interested in what those conversations with your family are like. Like, for instance, when you were like, I'm writing a book about this. Uh, let's start with that. Like, wow. and, and and I'm sure this is covered in the book that I will read, but have not yet read. But, you know, give us a teaser about it. Yeah, I mean, it's complicated. Um, I think one of the things I found in talking with a number of other ex-evangelicals or, or other people who are sort of post Post evangelical um, people use different different words for it, but the the experience is pretty similar in many ways. Um, is that you know family can be really difficult because for a lot of people being part of the evangelical community is really a big part of their identity. Like I think any group can be, and so that does create challenges with with family members in many cases. And you know a lot of people I talked to talked about having boundaries about what they what they talk about and what they don't with their family members, if they've had sort of a shift in their thinking. Um, you know, for me, it's different with every member of my family. And, and uh, you know, my brother is interviewed in the book. He talked about some of his own experiences. Um, you know, I have tried to be respectful of each relationship in, in different ways as much as I can, but obviously I couldn't write about my own life without writing about my family a little bit. So we've had some, you know, there've been some, some good conversations and some difficult ones, um, but I've tried to not navigate that the best that I can. So the uh, last question I'll ask about this is like the family members who you, who you have this boundary with where it's like, I, you know, they are still very much part of this church and we, this is not something we talk about. I'm just like, are they proud of you for writing a book? and for being an NPR correspondent who covers these issues, or does it just never come up? Um, I think it, it comes up sometimes, but honestly, I, I, I'd rather not answer that. It's okay, just, it's fine. No problem. Yeah. It's, I, it's, I, I get I mean, it. I get it. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I kind of said what I want to say about my family in the book, yeah. and, and I said That's a fine. lot, and I, I did get some They get YouTube from, in you know, Kansas City. It's okay if you don't want to answer it here. <laughs> no, it's okay. I mean, I, I asked my parents for some feedback. I let, I, I didn't want to blind, blindside them, um, but I don't really want to get into the details about those conversations because some of them they've asked me to keep private. That's fine. So let me ask you this then, because it's more useful to the audience. What is your advice to people who are listening who have, because this is clearly an experience you've had, who have differing views, particularly about politics, uh, with people they care about a lot? Like, do you have general principles for approaching those conversations? Because that's what we talk about a lot on this show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I think the answer is going to, it's going to depend a lot on the specifics of the relationship and the personalities involved. And so um, there are some people in my life that I just don't talk to about politics or religion at all. In fact, there are some people I have to say, if they venture into those topics, um, look, I, I really just am not comfortable having this conversation, you know, I love you, but I, I, that's just not a place I want to go, you know, mm -hmm. and that's hard to do. And I've had to, I wish I would have gotten better at that when I was younger, because I, I think it may be part of it is a product of evangelical culture where everybody is, you know, somebody the other day I was talking to called it testimony culture. Like you're always supposed to be sh able mm -hmm. to share your testimony and talk about what you believe. And I've realized that like, as much as I did write a book that is pretty intense, personal. In general, I, I'm not super comfortable with that. Like writing a book is one thing because you can sit down and, and even talk about personal things, but in a way you think through, you know, and I, I had multiple people in my life look at drafts and I crafted the words in just the way I wanted to say them. It's another thing to like have somebody just ask you like, like they do in church, like, how's your walk with the Lord? Like, that's just, 
that's something that evangelicals tend to feel really free to ask each other. But for me, it was yeah. always uncomfortable to, because you feel very on the spot. It almost is like being asked about your sex life or something. Like it's like, wow, this is so intimate and personal, and mm -hmm. I don't really think it's your business, <laughs> you know. Um, and so I've had to like one of the things I've had to learn is how to set boundaries lovingly around things, like how to say, I, I care about you, but I just don't feel comfortable talking about this with you, you know, and that it's not personal. It's not, it's not an attack. Um, there are other people in my family that I, you know, have probably some level of difference with, but that it, just because of the nature of the relationship, we can talk about some things we do kind of delicately or, Maybe we just kind of there. There, there are some people that are. It's kind of like unspoken boundaries. There's just certain things that we just don't bring up because we love each other and we don't want to offend each other. And I think that is a pretty common experience. Um, and so I think you, I think you have to feel it out. But I think you also have to kind of. It's been really helpful to me to think ahead if I'm expecting to be, like, in a conversation that might be uncomfortable or might end up going a bad direction and be damaging to the relationship. Just sort of almost go into it with an intention like this is this is my goal for this conversation and it's okay to say to kindly and lovingly say no you know yeah absolutely i that's something we've talked about a lot ravi that's been your experience at times people sure. in your family um, all right. Well, hey, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, the book, again, it's a New York Times bestseller. Clearly, it is doing well. It, people should run out and get it. It's called The Ex-Evangelicals, Loving, Living, and Leaving the White Evangelical Church by Sarah McCammon. Sarah, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. All right. Okay, uh, Ravi, uh, that's this week. What's going on with you? Oh, I don't know, actually. Um what is happening? It's just warm here in New York and, you know, we had an earthquake. Oh, yeah. I found out yeah. about the earthquake because I get notifications when you tweet, which you rarely do. Is that right? And, do yeah, you and I get that and I got a notification. It that it's about you, as common as an earthquake in New York. Yeah. Like, it, it, and it, I got a, a little notification that you tweeted like, OK, am I crazy or is that an earthquake? And I thought Ravi's going crazy. And then I opened Twitter and apparently everybody was experiencing an earthquake. So. Yeah, dude, I was in this cafe by my apartment and uh, it it felt like, you know, in New York, you have this experience, depending where you are, like the ground will rumble because there's a subway underneath. And so it rumbled uh -huh. as if there were a subway underneath. But then I was like, there's no subway under this. <laughs> uh, and everybody kind of looked around and then went back to what they were doing in classic New York fashion. <laughs> and then I Googled it. I was like, this, I, it really struck me because I've been in California in some earthquakes. I was like, this really felt like an earthquake, but New York doesn't have earthquakes. Sure enough, it was an earthquake. That's the most interesting thing happening in my world right now. What about yeah, you? Uh, you know, today is um, the 25th anniversary of mine and Diana's first date. Dude, um, your photo that you put up on Instagram was hilarious. She, had, you, you had like on a sleeveless shirt. Yeah. And she had on like I don't know what that coat was. Just like a it, coat with a furry. Yeah, lapel. is amazing. And, but if you Absolutely. look, she's in like sweatpants. I mean, I think we were, you know, 18 when that photo was taken. And it's um, really the. the it's a, by the way, you guys don't look that much different other than the clothes. I appreciate that. She looks uh, not hardly different at all. Yeah. Um, I, I It's okay. I look a lot different. But honestly, I feel like I look better. So I'm fine with it. I definitely look older. But I I, uh, I feel like I, you know, and she looks better every year. Um, but yeah, like it's uh, actually it's funny when I, I posted that. And the last picture I posted is of you know, a picture I took of her in the gym that I'm sure she's traveling in the moment. I'm sure when she gets home, she's going to be like, I, why did you post that? Cause she's much uh, more uh, modest than I am. Um, but what's funny is I did not mean to do this. I meant to post 10 photos, but for whatever reason, it posted that seventh photo of her in the gym three times. <laughs> so it, it looks like, I'm just like, seriously, don't miss how hot my wife is, you know? Um, and, uh, so I went in and I had to delete the the number eight and number nine photos, but she, yeah, she um, it. that's uh, so we're gonna try and find a way to celebrate a little bit this week, which is not easy to do when you have two kids, but that just means you know they're great and they'll probably come on that date with us, so uh, so it's totally fine. But oh. all right, um, 
This has been fun. We did it again. It was successful. Uh, you can find Ravi at, at Ravi M. Gupta uh, everywhere. You can find me at Jason Kander everywhere. Please leave a five-star review. Thank you to the Midas Mighty. Remember, we all have a platform. Make sure to use yours today. Thank you.